Welcome to the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I interview business leaders who are committed to their own growth and the development of everyone on their team. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for joining me today. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I love introducing you to people who've worked on their own development and help others become the best version of themselves. That's also a key focus of my company, Grow Strong Leaders. We publish software tools and books for improving the way people connect with each other at work. And you can find out more about us at growstrongleaders.com. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today because it's about one of my favorite topics, reading. And so I want to welcome my guest, Jeff Brown. Jeff, welcome to my show. Thank you so much for having me, Meredith. I'm excited to be here. Well, I am so looking forward to this conversation. I'm glad we were able to make time to have you join me. Let me tell my audience more about you before we jump in. Jeff is an award-winning radio producer and personality and former nationally syndicated morning show host. Following a 26-year career in radio, Jeff went boss-free in 2013, and soon after, he launched the Read to Lead podcast. Jeff's podcast has been has featured interviews with today's Best Business and Nonfiction Authors, including actor and author Alan Alda, Seth Godin, John Maxwell, Brian Tracy, and more than 300 others, including me. (laughs) Jeff has personally coached hundreds of successful podcasters around the globe, and he's consulted on podcasts for the U.S. government and numerous multi-million dollar companies. And he's the author of a new book, also called Read to Lead, with the subtitle, The Simple Habit That Expands Your Influence and Boosts Your Career. Thank you, Jeff, for showing that. So what I want to start with is having you talk a little bit about your journey as a reader. How did you develop this passion for reading? Well, it started as as a young child, as it does for many. Um, I loved mysteries, uh, fiction primarily. I remember reading The Hardy Boys and uh, Encyclopedia Brown and anything that involved a detective story and, and you know, being uh, you know, taken to the library by my mom as a kid and just you know coming home with a stack of books. Uh, and then school happened. Uh, and with few exceptions, uh, and I say this with all the love for teachers in the world, my sister's a teacher. I've been an educator at the college level in the past. Uh, and so this is not a knock on teachers, but uh, school succeeded over the course of uh, 12 plus years of educating out of me the desire to want to read, more generally, the the desire to want to learn, such that when I left college, my attitude, and this sounds ridiculous, but this was my my attitude then, was, thank goodness, all the learning is over. Thank goodness I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to read anymore, because I spent, as many of us do, much of my school time reading things and learning about things I had no interest in whatsoever. And so, I came out of it with this attitude that that's what learning is, is something that's not very enjoyable. And it's something that I want to avoid at all costs. Mm. Now, I don't know that I, that I, you know, thought many of those things consciously necessarily, but I think unconsciously uh, oftentimes to, to uh, sort of, sort of put a bow on that to the, to the extent that, you know, for the better part of my twenties on into my early thirties, I didn't read at all. If I read anything, it was a magazine, like an entertainment weekly or something like that. But I wasn't reading books, fiction, nonfiction at all, because I had been quote unquote taught that there wasn't anything out there that that was really for me as an adult. There were those books as kids that I enjoyed, but I'm an adult now and there's not really anything out there uh, for me. Um, And it took sort of an aligning of the stars and planets in the early 2000s uh, that included uh, an author I'm quite fond of, a guy by the name of Seth Godin and his book, Purple Cow, which was put in front of me uh, by my leader, my boss at the time, a guy named Matt Austin, who was pulling together the leadership team at the radio station I worked for at the time, a station I would spend half my career and wanting to instill in us 
this desire to grow personal, professional development, to learn and to do that primarily through books. And I, I, before being a part of the leadership team, knew that they got together and read occasionally. And I remember being intrigued by that. This was a, a group of people who I felt were the best in the business. And I'd come from a place of wanting to be the smartest person in the room. And I languished for many years because of that. That fed my ego. And I, 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 I languished because of that, because I wasn't learning. I wasn't growing. And now I was at a place where I was surrounded by people far better at their craft than I was, but at the same time, not resting on their loyals, uh, their, their laurels, wanting to get, get better. And that, that fascinated me. I thought, well, they've got it all figured out. What else is there to learn? Why are they taking time to do this? So when I had the chance to join that group, I was intrigued. That first book was Purple Cow. And I was at a place in my radio career where I was venturing into the marketing space. And that's the, the primary focus of that book. And so it was the right book at the right time. And when I sat down to read it, I thought, oh, my gosh, this is fantastic. This stuff's been out there all this time. And I've, I've not been taking advantage of this. I can get better at what I do by reading books. It's, it, it can be that easy. And I can pick and choose the ones I want to read. Wow. You know, it was like a revelation at 33, you know, as embarrassing as that is to admit. So um, that reignited that fire for reading. In fact, the book is dedicated in part to Matt and to Seth, who though they've never met, you know, came together to, to help reignite that fire. And so I owe much of my journey since then, the podcast of this book to, to that, uh, that reigniting that they were responsible for. Mm -hmm. Well, now that you have this podcast read to lead, you're reading a lot of books, I would guess, because your your guests are all authors, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so how have you created this consistent, habitual way of making sure you fit reading into your day? Yeah, I, I it certainly has to be a priority. As much as I love reading, it's still something that I schedule uh, to do. I mentioned to you before we started uh, recording this conversation that I just uh, uh, finished reading or putting down a book uh, from a mutual friend of ours, a guy named Todd Churches, that time I spent reading that is on my schedule for today. It's not only on my to-do list, but it was on my schedule, meaning that time was blocked out for it. Mm -hmm. I, I think what gets scheduled gets done. And oftentimes, most of us go through our business and personal life, we schedule the appointments and we schedule the meetings, and then we have a list of to-dos. And we'll presumably do those to-dos or work on those to-dos in between the meetings. What I do is I go so far as I look at those priorities for the day and I decide, well, when am I actually going to work on those things and block out that time? I work in time blocks. Mm -hmm. One of those blocks most days is a reading block, uh, you know, one or more, sometimes as, as much as two hours where I might read for 50 minutes and take a 10 minute break, you know, setting a timer using the Pomodoro technique, you know, and read for another 50 minutes and take a break or 25 minutes and take a five minute break, that sort of thing. So those sort of simple uh, techniques that most successful people use, uh, you know, come in real handy when it comes to things like reading. So because I've scheduled it, meaning that it's not only in my analog planner, but it's on my digital calendar, meaning it's protected such that when a client or someone who needs my time, who might go to a digital calendar, I have given them access to to schedule time. They're not going to see those times I've scheduled to read. Mm -hmm. So those times are protected just like the other appointments and, and meetings like the one you and I are having right now. Mm -hmm. That's great. I love that. I know one of the things you're fond of saying is that it's important for leaders to be readers. Mm -hmm. And so in the context of someone who's leading a team or running a business, uh, why, why is that such an important part of fulfilling their role successfully? Yeah, a couple of things come to mind uh, when you ask that. I, I have found in, in my time in leadership that whenever you face a problem, often we, whether we want to admit it or not, we tend to think that we're the first person who ever faced this problem. <laughs> and, and that's virtually never the case. Not only is it not the case, not only you're not the first person to face that problem, other people have faced that problem. And more often than not, others have written about having faced that problem. And so in my time in leadership, what I have found is whenever I've come up against an issue that I don't fully understand, or I don't know how to solve, the first thing I do is I go looking for books written by people who have faced this problem before. And more often than not, I'll find one or more. 
So there's that. And I also find too, that, um, you know, I come from, uh, early on a leadership style that was modeled for me. That was this command and control type leadership style. And I was that kind of leader early on such that, you know, I was the leader because I knew the most, I had the answers and your job is to just do what I tell you to do. And that's the style I, I mimicked for a while. Um, and it was through the reading that I was doing that helped me understand that, well, that's what I know because that's what I've been modeled. That's not the only way Were I not reading, I wouldn't have come across that idea or that thought as early as I did. So I was able to change that. And what I found is reading as a leader keeps you humble. And I think that's a very attractive trait as a leader to not be afraid to admit you don't know everything. Reading keeps you humble because reading constantly reminds you of what you don't know. <laughs> and so there's a lot I don't know. And reading helps, <laughs> helps me remember that I stay humble. I'm not afraid to admit it. You know, it's not unusual for me to be in a meeting back when I was in the typical traditional workspace or, or workplace. And, and somebody presents an issue or a problem. And I respond with something like, hey, you know, I was reading in so-and-so's book the other day, and she tackles this very issue. And her advice was X, Y, and Z. What do you guys think? And that demonstrates to my, my team as a leader that not only do I recognize that I don't always have the answers, but I'm actively and intentionally seeking them out from other people who I believe might be smarter than me. Mm -hmm. That, again, is another attractive trait in a leader. And it's also going to prompt your team to go, hey, if he does this, if she does this, maybe that's something I should consider too. So you're modeling that behavior for uh, them at the same time. That's so important. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think sometimes people in a leadership role feel like they're supposed to have all the answers. And, mm -hmm. and that puts tremendous pressure on them. Yeah. And yet if they, like you say, model the fact that they're always seeking answers they don't have them and i love the the uh, juxtaposition you said there where reading and getting an idea from an author sharing that and then asking the team's opinion so they feel valued um and that you're not just saying well so and so said we should do it this way <laughs> so that's <laughs> what we're going to do right so that's a whole different mm -hmm. approach i want to go into the subtitle because i really mm -hmm. liked that you know, reach late, expand their influence and boost their career. How does reading help someone do both of those things, expand their influence and boost their career? Well, I, I learned this from firsthand experience as I began my reading journey back in 2003, now nearly 20 years ago, um, I began experimenting with what I was learning because that's the not so always obvious next step. It's not enough just to learn, right? And fill your head with knowledge. If you're not doing anything with that knowledge, what good is it? Mm -hmm. They say knowledge is power. Well, no knowledge put into action. You can accumulate knowledge, but until you put it into action, it's not really doing anybody any good. And so as I began practicing what I was learning, experimenting with the things I was learning rel relative to my job, I found out a couple of things pretty quickly. There were things that I tried that failed, and those things were quickly forgotten. The things that I tried that succeeded were things that began to get me noticed uh, throughout the company, the nationwide company. I was in an operations director role. So the things that I was doing began to get noticed by uh, the uh, headquarters in Colorado Springs and then thereby uh, later the other operations directors. And they would come to me and say, Jeff, that thing you're, you're doing that's working. Tell me about that. Tell me about how you came to that conclusion. Where did you learn that? What's been your experience? How can you help me do that? And that led to then me getting various speaking opportunities within the organization to speak to the operations directors at their annual retreat. And then the nationwide, uh, nationwide sales team at their annual retreat. Um, and that then eventually led to uh, the president of the company uh, putting forth his 10-year vision, this is 2009, so 2010 to 2020, he called it his 2020 vision, and he was visiting various stations as a good leader does to get input on that vision, and when it came time for him to come to our station, my boss said, Jeff, I want you to be the person who gives our presentation to the president as to where we see our company going the next 10 years, where we think it should go. That invitation from my boss came as a result of 
that experimentation, that, that, that uh, trying things that came from the thing, things I was learning and through my reading. And so I did that presentation. That presentation was so well received that I got invited to corporate to give that same presentation at their annual meeting, something nobody uh, from my level had ever been invited to do. And then that led finally to when the president and CEO went to put together his vision and want to communicate it with the world, he tapped me to help him build his slide deck, to build his presentation. None of that would have happened had I not been reading. And by the way, those opportunities to speak when those first came about, I'd never done public speaking before. So one, uh, uh, what's the word, um, curriculum I created for myself was a public speaking curriculum. So I began reading different books about that topic so that when I got in front of these groups, I would feel like I had some <laughs> knowledge about what I was doing. My career had never given me that opportunity before. And again, because of that and that practice, it eventually led me to being the person who built the slide deck the president would use to communicate his vision to the world. From a guy who didn't know anything about public speaking to being in that position, it was all because of the reading that I was doing and the opportunities that reading was giving me. Now, that's me, but think about how that could apply to your world and your life. That's a real world example, several from my personal reading journey. And one of the reasons I'm so passionate about getting other people to pick up this habit, because I think when you do it, you can have the same kind of experience as I had. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a fabulous um, story. And what I was thinking of, it ties into the next question I wanted to ask you about was why people are resistant. Some people are resistant to reading. I doubt that too many of my listeners are, but, um, and how to get them interested in it. It occurs to me that one of the key ways is finding a, a book where the topic is relevant to something you need to know how to do in your job. Is that one of your pieces of advice? Let's go back first to why would you think people are resistant to mm. uh, devoting time, blocking time like you do for reading? Yeah, there's a couple of things that, that come to mind. And, and one of those is um, we don't want to learn. And again, this may not apply to many in your listening audience, but for anyone listening, think about someone you know who might be in this position. Uh, someone in your charge, family, uh, work, your team, what have you. Um, many of us don't want to learn uh, because learning means admitting at least briefly that you don't know something, which we're taught to avoid. And so it's easier not to learn and just get back to work. <laughs> and the other thing is, is we don't like to change our minds. If a book is going to help you get somewhere you've been unable to get to on your own, it means changing your mind about something. Two of the hardest things for people to say is, I don't know, and I was wrong. Reading books will heighten both of those things. They'll show you the things you don't know, and as I said earlier, help keep you humble as a leader. And sometimes they'll show you that, that ideas you had, long-held beliefs, may not actually be accurate like you thought they were. Mm -hmm. So both of those things make us uncomfortable, right? Admitting we don't know something, admitting we were wrong about something. And so a lot of people avoid reading because of both of the uh, reading nonfiction specifically because of both of those things. And I would encourage you uh, that if you want to grow, if you're going to grow, growth equals change. You can't grow without change. And if you truly want to uh, develop professionally and personally, that's going to require you to get outside your comfort zone. Uh, and that's where the magic happens. If you want to stay in your comfort zone, well, you know, good luck with that. But if you really want to make a difference in your life and the life of others, then that's going to necessitate you getting out of that comfort zone. And that can start, quite frankly, with reading and getting comfortable, more comfortable with the idea of learning things you don't know and having your mind potentially changed about long-held beliefs. You know, as you've been talking the last few minutes, I was thinking about Carol Dweck's books on having mm -hmm. a growth mindset, because that's really what you're, you're talking about. You have to be open to the idea that you have things to learn mm -hmm. and ways you can grow. And so having that mindset makes it easier to, I think, get into the reading habit. So yeah. one question then would be, what medium is, 
is best. And I guess it varies depending on the individual learner, you know, mm-hmm. printed books versus Kindle versus uh, audio. What are your thoughts on each of those medium? Yeah, I think many have their their personal preferences. I'm a big advocate for physical books uh, that you can, you know, actually turn the pages in and mark in directly and highlight and dog ear the pages and, uh, and, and touch and feel. And one of the reasons I'm a big proponent of those is I think there's something that happens in the brain that doesn't necessarily happen with those other mediums. Uh, all that's engaged in your brain with a physical book um, uh, is, is you know, far surpasses, in my view, those other uh, formats uh, most of the time. And so I like having a physical book and then a physical notebook uh, to write in. I actually use a paper tablet which is a digital the device that, that allows me to write in the paper tablet by hand. I think there's, there's you know, something magical that happens in the brain when we, uh, when we use our uh, writing instrument on a tablet of paper versus typing uh, uh, via a keyboard. So I like taking notes that way, the traditional way versus maybe the more modern way and prefer the traditional you know, physical book uh, because of the way the brain interacts with that. Now, you may be in a place in your life where you've decided that the only way you're going to have time to read at all is to listen to audiobooks on your commute or on your run or walking the dog or whatever and that's that's fine. If if that, you know, when I first started my reading journey, that's how I consumed most of the books that I read on my 40 plus minute commute uh, every day. That and 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 podcasts and that's okay. Um, get adept at uh, you know, utilizing your phone the best you can that doesn't require a lot of, you know, touching and whatnot while you're driving. What I like to do is, is put my audiobooks, if I'm listening to one while in the car, there's a feature with Audible, at least, where you can put it on car mode and you've just got two or three really large buttons. And yeah. one of them is a bookmark button. Um, it doesn't give you the option to then leave a note with that bookmark like the, the, the regular sc- screen does. But you don't need to be doing that while you're driving anyway, right? right. So, so, so just you know, get familiar with where that bookmark button is. It's nice and big, and whenever there's something said that you want to go back to and remember and take notes on later, just tap that button whenever you need to, and 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 then put in your schedule time to go back and re-listen to those sections when you can, when you're not in the car, when you're not running or walking the dog, or whatever, so you can take physical notes if if possible. Um, you know. Ebooks are great. Kindles are. I own a Kindle. I don't use it very much, honestly. Uh, my wife wanted me to push me to get one because the library was starting to get a little stuffed <laughs> to the gills. Um, but I honestly don't use it that much. When when my library gets too full, I donate my my physical books to our local library. But uh, I've got that if I need, you know, to, to travel with several books and I don't want to take the physical books, you know, because of space issues or weight or whatever. Uh, but I think ultimately it comes down to what are your preferences? Some of us learn better, uh, you know, in certain ways. Uh, but if I had my choice, definitely a physical book that I can write in, I can turn the pages, um, et cetera. And that, that to me, does nothing quite uh, matches that. Mm-hmm. I have to agree. I'm kind of old timey that way myself. Because <laughs> uh, I, I love going back to certain pages and, and rereading them and and making additional notes. And I want to echo your recommendation to use pen and paper Mm. to write out, because I think that does definitely get embedded in the brain more. What are your thoughts about speed reading? I've tried different approaches to that. And honestly, for comprehension, I find that if I'm trying to speed read, I'm not really absorbing the material as well. It may be my approach to doing so. But if you want to really learn the material and take away the most from it, is there a way to incorporate speed reading with that goal? There's a workaround that I'll talk about. Speed reading, I wouldn't recommend for the reasons you just stated. If you truly are, are looking to retain what you're reading, uh, to fully comprehend what you're reading, um, I would personally not recommend speed reading. I'll admit that my co-author, Jesse Wisniewski, is the real speed reading expert. And what he advocates is a very simple technique, and some may have heard of this, but it's using a pointer as you're reading and Mm. placing that pointer uh, in your book, using a physical book, obviously, and moving it at an uncomfortably fast speed and forcing your eyes to keep up with it, you know, starting slow. And with practice, 
working your way up to, to moving that pointer, pointer and having your eyes follow along at a pace that is, you know, slightly uncomfortable. This starts with um, uh, marking what your current reading speed is. And we have a formula in the book for figuring that out. And then using that as a starting point, a comparison. And then as you practice your speed, speed reading technique using that pointer, you can go back to that formula and, and, and determine, you know, how much your speed increased. And we've had a lot of readers uh, come back to us and say, that some say that their reading uh, speed has been increased as much as 33%, uh, percent, as much as a third. Mm. Um, now, the workaround that I hinted at uh, is, is a particular technique that I like. And we have a, a chapter in the book called How to Read a 220-Page Book in One Hour. Uh, that's not so much a speed reading chapter. There's another chapter called Double or Triple Your Reading Speed in Minutes. But this chapter on how to read a 220-page book in an hour is, is really about these techniques. And that's Understanding that with nonfiction, most nonfiction books are written a particular way such that um, first you need to determine why am I reading this book and write that reason down. What do I hope to get out of this book? What's the reason I'm reading it in the first place? Write that down, then look at that, that answer, then go to the table of contents and ask yourself, okay, based on this table of contents, are there specific chapters that are going to get me? to that point, that goal I've said I want, uh, you know, for reason for why I'm reading this book in the first place. And sometimes the answer to that question is yes. In fact, it's chapters four, five, and six that really get it to what I'm wanting to learn. Well, it's nonfiction. So give yourself permission to start there. We don't have to worry about, you know, missed <laughs> plot holes, <laughs> right? So we, I know I did with so many textbooks that we used to have to read as you start the beginning and you have to go all the way through. Yeah, well, that's not the case necessarily for most nonfiction. And it's especially the case when you've identified why you're reading the book in the first place, that can sometimes whittle down where you should start. Give yourself permission to start with those that chapter or chapters. Once you've read them, take a step back and ask, did I reach my goal? Did I get what I was looking for? And if the answer to that is yes, you can now put the book down. You're done with it. You can call that a read book. So that's sort of a, a, not speed reading per se, but it's, it's finishing a book in my definition uh, because you got out of the book what you said you wanted to get out of it before you started reading it, right? Uh, some other things and techniques you might consider if, if you're going maybe through more of the book than that. Um, again, nonfiction. Start by reading the uh, section headings. Familiarize yourself with what the author is trying to communicate in that chapter. Then go back to the beginning of the chapter. And that process, by the way, might take you, you know, five, 10 minutes, depending on the book. Go back to the beginning of the chapter, now that you've read the, the various section headings, and read the first and last sentence of each paragraph. Once you've done those two things, you will have absorbed, in a lot of cases, 75, 80% of what the author was trying to get across from you, across to you. Reading the section headings from beginning to end of the chapter, then reading the first and last sentence of each paragraph. That's where most of the meat is. So that's how you can read a 220 page book in an hour. Oh, that's great. I love that. Uh, and you know, some authors summarize the key points from the chapter at the end of each sure. chapter, which also can save time. Absolutely. So if you're wondering what the content of a particular chapter really consists of, if they have that, that's very useful too. Mm. Absolutely. So we're reading here not just to gain knowledge. We want to get this information for a reason. So mm. you have figured out different ways to remember and actually apply what you read. And I think it would be really valuable if you could share some advice to people about what are some things they could do to make sure they remember it and then put into action what it is they mm. learn. Uh, one of the things I would suggest is maybe considering or reconsidering how you currently take notes. If you're like most people, you take notes as you're reading, meaning you stop and start a lot. You stop to take a note on something you just read, and then you pick back up with the reading. And that often requires you to reread a part of what you just read to kind of, oh, where was I again? And what did, what did she say? Okay. And you, you kind of overlap a lot of your reading, and it, and it really slows down your reading, frankly. And you, you get to the end of a, of, you know, a 25 or 50 minute or two hour session and you're frustrated because you didn't get as much reading done as you wanted. Um, and so what I would recommend you consider to see if this works better for you is to when you set that 25 or 50 minute timer or whatever the, the time frame is, is just read and force yourself to only make uh, marks, simple marks in your book. So maybe that's 
um, an asterisk for something that's of particular importance that you know you want to come back to and dig in more deeply, or a star. Uh, then maybe one's a question mark to signify something you're not sure you quite understand yet, or maybe you're not even sure you agree with and you want to dig into more deeply later. And then the third note you might make is a cue. Maybe the author said something in a particularly pithy way, and it's a quote that you like to study or remember and maybe even use in a future talk or something along those lines. So a star or asterisk or question mark and a cue, just you know, limit yourself to those three symbols. Then when you're done, take your break and come back and your next 25 or 50 minute session, assuming you, you, you finish the, the section of reading you wanted to do in the first session. Now, when you come back, you're just taking notes. You're going back to those marks you made and you're digging more deeply. You're, just, you're, you're, you're free from reading now uh, in the traditional sense, and you're just taking notes from those markings uh, and those things you want to remember. So that's one way. Another way is to combine a couple of medi mediums. We talked about uh, audiobooks and, and ebooks and, and physical books. One of the things I love to do is take the physical copy of a book and then follow along as it's read to me, often by the author, via the audiobook. And you talked about struggling with speed reading. This is another speed reading cheat. Um, one of the things about speed reading or attempting to, to, to read quickly is we do this thing called sub-vocalization. Many of us, when we were taught to read as kids, we were encouraged to sound the words out loud. And that's great for teaching kids how to read. As we grow into adulthood, many of us continue as we're reading, we're sounding the words sort of in our minds, like each individual word, we're, we're hearing it in our brain. And that really hinders us from being able to read quickly, right? And so that whole pointer idea I talked about earlier can help you get, get past that. And there's some other techniques we talk about in the book and, and reading groups of words or every few words on a line versus every single word. But I like this audio book uh, physical book combination, because what I'll do is I'll put the audiobook on a fast speed, a faster that I could, than I could possibly read myself speed, one and a half or 1.75 speed. And follow, now they're reading every single word, but they're reading it much faster than, than I ever could. And following along that way, I get through books much faster, mm -hmm. but because I'm consuming it in two ways simultaneously, I'm seeing it on the page and I'm hearing it at the same time. That has helped me increase retention and comprehension while getting through a book more quickly. Hmm, that's a great tip. I love that. Uh, hmm. I'll definitely need to attempt to do that because <laughs> you know, my frustration with audiobooks, as much as I love podcasts and I listen to podcasts mm -hmm. all the time, listening to a book is somewhat different because there's usually notes that I'm used to wanting to take and I feel like I have to write down so much. I can't underline. By the way, I have one other mark that I make. I use all the ones you just mentioned, but I also do an exclamation point. If mm. they say something that just startles me, yeah. it's really <laughs> important and like a aha moment for me. <laughs> I love that. So I add that one. So Jeff, Tell me, is there anything else that I haven't asked you about that you feel like would be an important piece from your book that you'd like my audience to know about? Um, well, I would say that if you want, if you're looking at your team and, and you're maybe you're asking the question, you know, this is great, or I'm already a reader. Um, I just love it. What uh, would love to make my team realized the importance of this habit. One of the things I would, I would say is to, is to let them catch you in the act if they aren't already. It's one of the things I loved about that former boss of mine is I remember walking by his office and he'd be reading a book. And, and before I was a part of this, this reading group at the company, I would think to myself, because this is how I viewed reading is he's goofing off. He's not doing his work. He's reading a book. It, it, it didn't occur to me to concern myself with whether it was fiction or nonfiction or what the genre was. I just saw him reading a book and, and, and viewed that as goofing off. And then one day I asked him, I, I didn't tell him that I was thinking he was goofing off, but I just asked him what he was reading. And it was a book that I'd never heard of called Good to Great by Jim Collins. And, and asking him about that book prompted a conversation that, that involved him explaining to me about the hedgehog principle and some concepts in that book. And it really piqued my interest and my curiosity. And I realized in short order that he was bettering himself as a leader sitting there reading that book on company time. He wasn't goofing off at all. And that helped 
open me up to being receptive then later to when I had a chance to be a part of that group where reading was just a thing that they, that they did. You can't force it on your staff. Um, they've got to see you doing it before they're going to want to do it. So you've got to model it for them. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of one other thing I do want to ask you about. And that is, I think you have worked with some companies where they've as a group read your book and then you have interacted with them. So I think that's another approach a leader could take if there's a specific book that they feel could be very powerful for everybody to have a sort of common knowledge that we operate from. What would be a good approach for that? Yeah, you're, you're talking essentially about potentially at least a book club and and much like the sort of catch uh, you, uh, them catching you reading type of, of idea, um, a book club uh, sort of forced upon your team from from on high often doesn't work. <laughs> hey, we're going to read this book team and then next we're going to read this book and they're like, oh boy, here we go. Uh, so it almost for, for that kind of thing to work, especially if it's something you're going to do on a regular basis or hope to do on a regular basis, as, as a lot of companies do is it almost has to be someone else's idea. Uh, when you let them catch you reading and, and they get curious about it and they start doing it themselves, oftentimes you can quickly identify some reading evangelists within your organization, within your team, and talk to them about their desires and goals with regard to that and maybe hint at them uh, starting a, a, a book club. When it comes from a peer versus coming from the boss, I think you'll find that your team is a lot more receptive to it, or at least equipping somebody um, with the go ahead, you know, to to do something like that and encouraging them in the process. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, I've accepted every invitation that I'm aware of that I've gotten to do exactly that. Authors love talking about their books. They love seeing people coming together and reading them. Uh, Team at LinkedIn um, is in year two of their book club now. And uh, they kicked off year two with read uh, to lead and had me in to, to share about the book uh, after having read it. And so they were able to ask questions of me, maybe things they wanted to dig into more deeply or didn't understand. I've done that many, many times myself with other authors. Um, I used to have a monthly uh, book club, a membership uh, club uh, made up of listeners of my podcast. And we would meet monthly and talk about the book we're reading. And oftentimes the author themselves would be a part uh, of, of that meeting. And those reading the book, having just finished the book, love being able to have that interaction Mm -hmm. with the author. That's something too, that I help companies create if they're, if they're struggling to get something like that going, particularly um, if they, if, if they are intrigued by the idea of being able to connect with the authors, you know, that way, uh, that's something I can come in and and help you set up and create and, and get going, you know, for a few months or the first year or what have you. That's great. Thank you, Jeff. This has been so fun. I, I love talking about, one of my very favorite topics where I block time is first thing in the morning because I get busy with doing, and I want to take um, under consideration your comment about blocking time during the workday for reading. (laughs) Because I tend to, well, I like starting the day filling my head, you know, with fresh material. It's like I can absorb it easier, but I like the idea also of looking at other, other opportunities for building that in. Thank you so much for all that you shared today around reading and why it's important and ways to really incorporate that. You are are just a wealth of information about this important mm. topic. And I want to just thank you so much for being my guest today. Well, Meredith, thank you for having me. I, I so appreciate the opportunity to chat with people about these topics. As you can probably tell, I'm very passionate about them and yes. you do a great job with your questions as a host. So I appreciate the time you put into this to, to, to make this uh, turn out really, really, really well. Appreciate it. Thank you. Please let people know how they can connect with you and get a copy of read to lead. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, the best way to reach out to me is Jeff at read to lead podcast.com. It's kind of a long address. Uh, you can find out more about my podcast at read to lead podcast.com. And more about the book. In fact, you can download the introduction and first chapter for free when you go to readtoleadbook.com. So readtoleadpodcast.com, readtoleadbook.com. And you can reach out to me, Jeff, at readtoleadpodcast.com. Great. Thank you so much. And I look forward to staying in touch and 
learning more from you on your podcast, which I highly recommend to everyone. Jeff is such a wonderful host and he interviews authors. It, it, I'll tell you, you have to watch your budget though, because <laughs> every interview he does makes you want to go out and get that book too. Mm. But um, they're all worth listening to. And the authors do a great job of sharing specific tips from the books. So thank you, Jeff, for your podcast. And again, for being my guest today. Thanks, Meredith. Thanks for tuning in to my podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com and check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. While you're there, download the free facilitator guide to find out how to implement our unique peer coaching system. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.